So we, Jack loves the marble runs on YouTube. What? It's literally a track and a person <laughs> drops marbles down the track and the marbles go down the track and into the back of a toy truck. And then they push the truck out of the frame. It's like hypnotizing. I don't know. It's probably like way overstimulating or something. I don't know. What a day to be alive. <laughs> Have you ever heard, and it's very buzzy on social media now, living in your masculine as a female. Yes. This isn't gender dysmorphia stuff. This is like living in your masculine here. Yeah. And what does that mean to you? I think it's like taking control a little bit more. I think that we've talked about it before. Like you and I are both kind of in our masculine kind phase, of? especially. Kind of? Yeah. Okay. You are, you have a red raging masculine flag over you. But I also think that in motherhood, it kind of forces you to be in your masculine, which is so bizarre because it's the most feminine thing that you could ever experience is to become a mother. But this like, you got to put on this cape of like, you're in charge of the family, you're in charge of the kids, you're in charge of the household, you're in charge of all of these things. And you kind of have to wear that masculine shield to almost like get things done. But again, it's supposed to be the most feminine experience of your life. So we have someone who is way smarter than both of us combined to talk about this, Monica Yates. And I'm going to bring you in because what you said is we have to put on this cape, we have to put on this mask. And that in my own, I think I'm a pretty self-reflective person and I think I'm getting pretty good at it the older I get. I also mm. have therapy at this point in my life. That is more than one therapist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Monica, I'm trying to add you to make it a quartet. I have a trio going right now, but I would love for it to be a quartet, but your waiting list is longer than your hair, which is really long and perfect. Um, you're just so perfect. Anyway, I'm going on a rant, but you said you have to put on your cape. You have to put on this mask. I think that that, is this crazy, unattainable bar that we've set for ourselves, especially at millennials. Like, you just have to do everything yourself and you have to be perfect. And you also have to post on social media that your family is perfect and send out Christmas cards. And it's like, holy crap, lady, you need to just take a breath. But we think that that is the survival mode. And we think that we have to do it all of our, ourselves. And Monica, I'm going to bring you in. What is your official title? Because I just look at you as this like, woman who has it all creature. figured out, <laughs> who lives in her feminine, who commands respect. And then you have an accent on top of it. And I'm just like, <laughs> can I be you? <laughs> okay. What is my title? My title is, I have like a few, I combine them all because I do a lot. My title is trauma healer, feminine and masculine embodiment coach, and then period expert. It's Cause they all kind of came at different times and I blend it all together. That is my title. And you're rocking it right now. So how long is Thank your wait you. list actually? And what are people uh, actually, waiting for? Yeah. So when, when, when Casey's saying my wait list, she's meaning one-on-one. -on -one. And I actually think I've now filled out the rest of the year, which is so amazing. But also like, I'm like, shit. Cause I, I was filling out my October spaces and then the space of like two days, I think they've all been taken. I'm waiting for two people to pay um, invoices. So uh, if usually, they don't pay, please call me. Okay. I will. <laughs> I will. I will. I'll send you an email. Uh, yeah. Usually my wait list is about six months. Um, I actually try to purposely not fill it too far in advance because otherwise I hate being in this situation. Like I so deeply want to help people. And then it's like, it's so filled up and then someone emails me and they want to start next month and I can't. So I try to wait as long as I can to be like, okay, doors are open. But unfortunately, not unfortunately, like I, there's also a situation and it's a blessing where people are like, no, I want to pay right now. Book me in. Like I'm not waiting. So, um, yeah. You are describing this intense, insane, overwhelming need. Women want your help yesterday. And you write these beautifully articulate, uh, captions under all of your posts. We were just saying your social media is unbelievable. What is the problem? What are you fixing? The problem is women think they have to be like men. To like put it in one sentence, I would say that is the problem. We have all, and you know, it's so multifaceted. Like I'm really not one of those coaches that just simplifies everything. There is so many nuances. Like you have to add context to things. Everyone's having their own unique situation. And I think what makes me different from other people is the fact that I actually 
say that. And I am really aware of that. This is not a one size fits all by any means, but you know, for the vast majority of us, we have to appreciate that we would never even be able to, as women get on this podcast, if it wasn't for feminism, right. And if it wasn't for women fighting for now, what we have, the pro- I have goosebumps, but the problem is, is that it's gone too far and we are still fighting for nothing. We are fighting, we are fighting for the sake of fighting. Right. And so what it's kind of gotten lost in translation where women think they have to be like men in order to be enough, to be successful, to yes. be seen, to be heard, like, etc. Like there is this, there's this concept of like, oh my God, she's such a feminine B I T C H. Like, mm-hmm. oh, she's just hard and rough around the edges and like, isn't soft at all. And we've gotten to that point. I mean, me included. I need to check myself because I'm like, I need to ask for help. I need to lean into my husband. I need to be, I want to be led. And I'm sure you get some backlash because the things you say are, would maybe strike somebody as anti-feminist. Like Mm -hmm. you want the man to take control. You want to be in your feminine. You want to, you know, kind of take the, take the back seat. Back seat has a negative connotation. Yeah, back seat. Yes, I do. I want to submit. I want to let go. (laughs) Yes, I want to submit. Yes. And it's like, listen, we're not getting into 50 shades here. But um, what are some issues that women have? Let's talk about that. Like real world things for people who are listening, who are now five minutes in and they're like, I still don't know what that means. And like, what are issues that women have? Okay. So we had to get to a certain point as women to have what we have now in the modern world. Amazing. We are here, right? So we we are thinking that we still have to fight for something when we don't have to fight for anything. And it's, it's funny. It's like, ugh, I go on this forever, but it's more so in my book, even when it comes to like the pay gap, it's like, if you actually read the race research, there isn't actually a pay gap as a maternity gap. Women want to spend more time at home. So they get paid less generally speaking, but it's not actually that there is necessarily a pay gap. So there is a lot of it is also social media. It's media that's, that's continuously feeding us as women into this story of like, we are not enough. We have to keep working harder. We have to wear this like badge of honor, hyper independence. But if we were to just say, okay, what are some of the issues? The most common issues that we're now seeing, which is the physical manifestation of all of these problems is for one infertility. Like you look at men's testosterone levels, like yes, environmental factors are a big component of that. Men are so feminine these days. Because that's of, why they call them like soy beta dudes. Right. And it's not because <laughs> it's not because they want to be like that per se. It's like the way that society has been moving. Um, and you know, for women, we're also struggling with intense infertility. Women are also struggling with their periods, with hormonal issues and whatnot. And it's the it's literally the, the result of us all thinking that we have to operate like a man in order to get things done, to be respected, to be enough. Because for the vast majority of us, we weren't like we weren't, we didn't grow up in a household where our mother taught us how to be a high value, respectable woman that, you know, is graceful and soft and warm and nurturing, but also has her boundaries. You know, like my, my fiance, he like, he sees that soft eye, but he also knows that I am not a woman to be with. And that is what a lot of women are missing. They think that they have to go like super, super soft and that they can never command respect. They can never have boundaries. They can never put their foot down anymore. Um, and that's just not the case. So the illusion of all of that, there's just, I think, I feel like there's just so much confusion. And so women just kind of get stuck in like the, I don't know what to do. Um, or they are oversimplifying the solution to it. You had a reel that went viral recently, something like 30 or 45 million views and thousands of comments that people got very heated in the comment section. And I want you to explain it to us. The reel said, men that say no are the men that you want to be with. What did you mean by that? And like, give us a little bit of why your audience was kind of going at it over that. So, well, it wasn't my audience, right? It was like, because I hate when reels go viral sometimes because it <laughs> wasn't my, my audience. I've actually posted the reel before and it didn't go viral. Um, it did well, but like didn't go viral. So basically my audience understands this and they also read the caption, which has the context, but yep. people on Instagram just don't read things and then they take it for whatever they want to take it as. And want to fight. Yep. They want yes. to fight. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. And so, um, long story short, What it basically means is that, and this goes for honestly any relationship that you're in, you want to be with somebody that you respect and that respects you. You don't want to be with a man that is a pushover. It's actually unattractive. There is something, there's like an aphrodisiac. There is something so sexy that happens when you are just like being all womanly. And then he's just like, no. Yes. Like there's just something where you're like, oh, and it just is like exciting, (laughs) right? Yeah. Because- 
it's this like primal part of us where we want to be directed. We don't want to have to make the decisions. We don't want to have to be thinking all the time and controlling ourselves all the time. We want to feel like he's, he knows what our limits are and we can just be free birds. And he's going to tell us when we are hitting the line and to like slow it down and stop kind of thing. And it, it's this feeling of our nervous system as women, we can relax because he's in control. But it's like no one, no woman gets turned on when, you know, whether you're single or whether you're dating, when you basically want to go out on a date and he's like, okay, what do you want to do? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, what? I kind of no woman. Or like whatever you want. No, you, I will tell you from well, experience. I, but also let's remember that me. Casey's like, I need to get on your wait list, Monica. I need, I need to work with you, Monica. So like, I of am, course. Am, I am patient zero. Like I need this. <laughs> so, you know, the amount of women that complain these days with dating of how bad it is out there because men don't plan. Shit. They don't pick you up. They don't plan dates. They don't pay for dinners. It's not sexy. Um, and this isn't about some like, or maybe it is like, I don't fucking care about some like gender norms. It's about the fact that we need to play to our biology and men are wired to be the protectors, providers, the directors, the like, you know, the container for everything. And we want to feel just like we can be kind of wild and free and we're not going to get ourselves into a dangerous situation, essentially. I was going to say it's hard because we were saying like society has just pushed this message that, well, you should be misindependent. Mm -hmm. And you don't need him to plan the date and you should do this and you should do that. And it's like, yeah, okay. Sometimes it's nice to be able to like, quote, get what you want. But also I am very much in your corner here of like, I just want it to be done. I want to feel like I, I'm not a traditionalist by any means, but I do feel like I have traditional values in that sense of like, yeah, I do just want it to be taken care of sometimes. Yeah. I came into the relationship. My husband was very much like that. He was very much like, I will pick you up at seven. And the whole thing is planned out. The whole thing is done. We're doing this. We're doing that. He's taking my hand. We're going here. We're going there. As we got married, that lessened. And I kind of came at him one time of like, what am I not worth it anymore? Like, what's the deal? Why are you this way? Like, was that only because we were dating? And I realized it was because I was being so hard on him that he was like, I'm scared to disappoint you. So like, I'm scared to make decisions. I think in motherhood and case, I'd be interested to see what, what you think here. I think in motherhood that even intensifies more because I know me as a mom, I, I become a huge bitch when I'm like, why did you put that diaper on? Why didn't you do that? The other diaper? Why oh, did you do that no, one? Why no, did no, you no. leave the diaper there? Why, wait, why did you like put those that. pants on? He needs to be wearing these shorts. He needs to be doing that. Like I over criticize everything that my husband does no. to a fault that he has stopped making some decisions and then I'm like why aren't you making decisions he's like because I am literally scared to death of you (laughs) see I think it's not like the opposite but like not that Eric picks me apart but I I don't know I just try to respect him all the time I would never do that like here's a here's an example so we Jack loves the marble runs on YouTube it's literally a track and a person (laughs) drops marbles down the track and the marbles go down the track and into the back of a toy truck. And then they push the truck okay. out of the frame. It's okay. like hypnotizing. I don't know. It's probably like way overstimulating or something. I don't know. But he loves it. Anyway, so we bought Jack a marble run. And he put one in his mouth the other day. And I freaked mm. out. And then like had nightmares for two nights about Jack swallowing a marble and dying. And I'm like, I don't know how to bring it up to air because he got him this marble run and I don't want to hurt his feelings and he's such a good dad and he built this marble run and this is their thing and it's so cute, but my son could die. And so that's like, I have, but I also have in my work. No, I would have reamed Mark out the second that Jack picked it up. I bought a marble run too. So it's like both of us did. But I, with my therapy, with three of my, the third of my three therapists, uh, I'm doing nervous system regulation with Katie Child, who we also, also as a friend of the show. And, yes. um, I have an anxious attachment disorder issue, whatever it is that you, call. I wouldn't say it's a disorder, but continue. <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't know me, girlfriend. <laughs> You're about to get to know me. Monica's going to be like, and you have a disorder. <laughs> <laughs> it is not a disorder, but you made it. So the, what, the thing that I always think of Gianna, when you talk about like the planning and everything, you know, the meme where the girl is like singing a song, walking through the airport. I forget which song, yeah. which like 2000 song. And the husband's like nearest exit, shady person, person over there, yeah. uh, suspicious backpack. That is me. 
I am that person. The I am the doomsday. I, I am the doomsday prepper. I am the let's get guns. I am the let's plan for the worst situation. Where is the exit? Oh, that so is you're who, you're that. Oh, okay. That yeah. is you're me. The, so you're the man essentially. Yeah. And my husband is like, stop scaring away our friends. Like every okay. dinner date, you don't need to talk about the end of the world in fifteen minute cities. I'm like, well, they're coming. And he's like, well, so so Monica, <laughs> tell us about that because I feel like that's a big thing that goes around too about like the passenger princess. Mm -hmm. Of like, I growing up and when I was in my twenties, like was probably how Casey is explaining. Like that was me. I was the one I was traveling by myself. I was, I was the one planning the girls trips. I was, you know, very comfortable in that space, but also making sure I was aware of my surroundings and all of those things. But then as I got married, I totally just passed over the the keys to my husband he is a logistic person love planning trips my mom gets so crazy because she'll be like what time's your flight leave tomorrow and I'm like I don't know <laughs> okay <laughs> like, let me give you this let me give you like, this tidbit though so Eric from the time he was probably like 13 years old was in travel baseball and then was drafted to the league at 18 when you're a professional athlete you are told where to be when to be there what to wear where to stand, what to That's do, true. who to talk to, who your friends are, what to eat. Like it is literally, you get an itinerary every day of your life. Well, so Monica, like, is there, is there one that's right or wrong? Like, are you saying as a woman, you should be in your feminine in this is there area one of your life or all? in your masculine in this yeah. area of your life? Or is it, is it determined by your wants and needs in life? Like, how does it work? I am a hundred percent. There is no one size fits all because that would just yeah. be stupid to say that because like we are too complex as human beings, but something that I want to quickly really, uh, I want to quickly touch on that you said, Casey was about like the respect, the whole no thing is important for every, every platonic relationship. If you don't want to end up in a relationship where it's like you resent each other because you're not chasing each other. He's never planning dates anymore. Like you have to speak your truth, right? You have to speak your needs. So many women don't even know what they need. They don't say no to their man, right? They don't, they get angry when their man says no to them because they immediately jump to, he's gaslighting me. He's manipulative. He's toxic. I'm like, no, he's a respectful human being. that's allowed to say no to you. And so a lot of it also, I'm like, so I feel like so many problems in a relationship these days are social media influenced in that people are jumping to these one size fits all conclusions. And they're really not understanding like what actually it means to be in a relationship and that, you know, there are so many different components that are needed in order to have a healthy functioning relationship. And like part of that, even then on your point, Casey, with like the itinerary is if you know that you need your husband to plan certain things, to do certain things, then it is your responsibility to communicate that to him. Right. And at the end of the day, if you have, if you're in a relationship with a man that wants to be in as masculine and some men these days are like, no, I love being lazy. And we've done that. Like we, as women have fostered that environment where we accept their laziness. And then we're all yeah. complaining of why they're lazy and why they don't do anything. And it's like, well, they don't have to, you're the one that will cook dinner, clean up, fill up the, the car with petrol. You'll pay the bills. You'll make the money. Like you'll take the kids to school. You'll do everything. So they have it so easy. They don't have to do anything. Like feminism was great for men, right? Cause now we're doing everything for them. If you actually are in a relationship with a man that genuinely wants to lead you, a lot of men these days, the surveys that I've done, they don't even know how to actually lead. That that is it. And that's what I want to say. And obviously I know you have these courses. You don't, it's not just one-on-one. -on -one. You can do newsletters. Yeah, yeah. You have so many different tiers of options, yeah. but in a nutshell, because this is my, this is where my, my devil's advocate goes, okay, I want to change the cycle. I'm going to work on myself, but how does that look to him? Is it all of a sudden I'm just like, I'm not cooking dinner tonight and you better plan a date for tomorrow night. And like, I don't know. Like, it's just like, so my answer was like, is like, generally speaking, again, generally speaking, add context, don't do that because that can really <laughs> be done with a lot of resentment Correct. and just like, you know what, Fuck you, I'm not doing anything for you anymore. And that's not helpful to anyone. That's not high value behavior on your part. And that's not fostering a healthy relationship. Just like you would want him to tell you if he needs you to do something differently, you deserve to do like, he deserves to have the same in return. So firstly, the starting point is you need to figure out what you need 
in your relationship to be happy. And then the second thing is you need to communicate that to him. Then you can follow on with, you know, if he's not actually doing it, then that's where it's like actions speak louder than words. Like are you then just like, all right, no worries. And then you just keep doing everything for you or are you actually standing your ground. And that's again, where it's like, you want to be in a relationship where not just a man is saying no to you, where you say no to your man, right? So that reel was just like one example, right? Obviously caught people's attention, went viral, great. But really it's as a woman, you need to say no to your man. And as a man, you need to say no to your woman, because if you can say no to each other, you are in a safe relationship where you can actually speak your truth and you can put your foot down. That is how you respect each other. And that's how you keep being better for each other. Most people, they become very complacent and they they, they don't keep becoming the best version of themselves. And now they're not attracted to each other 30 years down the track. They're attracted to another person walking down the street because yeah. we haven't looked after ourselves. Well, it's a trust thing too. I think with my mm-hmm. husband and I, we are very communicative with each other. And that if he says to me like, no, I don't want to do this thing, or I don't want to go to this event, or I don't want you to do something like I know to really stop and trust and listen to that because he doesn't just yes me all the time, or he doesn't just go with the flow and say whatever. Like I noted that, okay, that's, there's really a red flag being raised to him. And he has like, he's respected me enough and our relationship enough to come up and say that, then I need to like, I need to really take a second look at it. Right. Right. Saying no is a powerful thing because otherwise it builds the resentment because you end up being people pleasers. You're doing things you don't want to actually do. Then you start hating your partner and like nothing actually, nothing productive comes from that place. Being able to be in a relationship where you can actually say no to each other creates the safety in a relationship that most people But how people do you missing. say no if that's maybe somebody's listening and they're like, because we've had communication coaches on before and communication is a huge issue in relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you say no without sounding like a B-I-T-C-H mm-hmm. or without just coming off abrasive and abrupt and just being like, well, I have a new therapist named Monica and she told me that I'm in my feminine now, so I don't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> yes. So yeah. And uh, people think being in your feminine is like one depiction of things. Like people just like you think of like Snow White and she's just like, well, even for example, I want to come <laughs> back to this, but even as an example yeah. of this, because that was a really good question. Um, I posted on my Instagram stories like a few weeks ago, a Q and a, and one of the questions was like, you know, it was kind of vulnerable for me to answer, but I was like, no, I want to share this. One of the questions was like, why isn't your fiance just a partner in your business? Why is he like an employee? And I answered it in a very like, respectful way in terms of, well, why would like, you can read it. It's in my highlights if you're curious, but basically a set like the, you know, uh, bottom line of it was why would I make him a partner in my business when I don't want to make him a partner in my business? When I've grown my business before I even met him, that would be people pleasing. Right. And anyway, I kind of wrote out in a very just respectful, calm way, explaining why he's not a partner in my business. And then this woman responded to the story also, telling me like, how- why are you looking in like how my business is structured? Well, no, my argument was like, you don't even know what he is. You assume I pay him as an employee. Like you don't know how I pay him. Like you don't even know how, like, do you know what I mean? Like you don't even know what it is exactly to your point. Anyway, and this woman responded and she basically accused me for being very masculine, not being in my feminine. Like, how are you teaching people this when you're not being in your feminine? And I was like, huh, this is really interesting that she needs you to sign think... up for the one-on-ones. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was great. I wrote, I wrote a whole email about it. It was great content, but it was great content because I was like, this is becoming an issue where feminine and masculine is becoming so trendy and such yes. buzzwords that women are thinking, oh, I just have to basically please him. And then I'm in my feminine. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's how we got to this problem in the first place where women had no rights. What it actually is, like, you can't just think that there's this one way of being feminine. Part of also being, you know, a feminine woman is saying no and not doing something to please the other person. So coming back to like, how do you actually say no? The first thing is that I want to like ask the listeners is what is your relationship with the word no? Because for a lot of women, they can't say no. Like that's the issue. They'll sit here and be like, yeah, all well and good, Monica, for you to say, just say no, but I physically cannot say the word no. A lump comes up in their throat, their throat closes, they go into a freeze response. And that's why I add this whole layer of like being your feminine with the trauma stuff, because you, it's so easy to be like, just being your feminine. That is not how it works. You don't just dance around and wear cute dresses to be in your feminine. (laughs) 
And like for a lot of women though, they physically cannot speak their truth because they've grown up in an environment, for example, where every time they express their needs, they were told, be quiet, you're annoying. Like essentially they were shunned for speaking up. So they are so afraid that if they were to say no to their partner, and this goes for men as well. If they have, if they say no to their partner, they're so worried about their partner thinking less than, rejecting them, abandoning them, you know, getting in trouble. And um, so, you know, if you listening can say no, but maybe your partner struggles to say no, whether it's a man or a woman, you also, you know, have the beautiful thing of being in a loving relationship with this person where you can remind them that you want them to say no, that it's safe for them to say no. Mm -hmm. That you are, excuse me, that you won't get them in trouble for saying no, that you're going to, you won't think less of them. You'll actually think more of them when they say no. Like, let's not forget that we can kind of heal each other in relationships by reminding But it's not just partner. no. It's not like you're, you're dating no, or in right. a relationship with a dictator and you're like, oh, like my, you know, like my family has a wedding coming up. Can we go? No. It's like, well, no, you know what? We, we have this that weekend. And, and right. what if we, what if we did that? You know, I think it's more than just saying no it's that you know exactly. I'm, I'm just open, using con- yes yeah, yeah. I know, i'm just like using no as like a to but to you your, it's speaking your truth right it could right, just be right. i don't feel like doing that it could you, be whatever you talked about um i saw in one of your reels how you had you struggled losing weight and you really yes. were in this like dark place for a long time was that were you not able to say no to your partners was that a big thing Oh, no, I'm an Enneagram eight. So I've never had a problem saying no. Uh, what is that? <laughs> okay. An Enneagram eight is you know, basically G? like, I, I've heard of them. I don't know what I am or, or what really any of them. Means. Basically, it's like, it's like a personality test, but it's based on childhood trauma, essentially. So there's different numbers and the numbers aren't like ranked in a certain order. Yeah. It's just that I'm the number eight and Enneagram, um, the Enneagram eight basically is we are the opposite of people pleasers. Normally people are afraid of us and we're like <laughs> quite, we, we can, we, when we are the, in the unhealed version of an eight, there's like a healed and unhealed version of each one. The unhealed version of the eight is very bitchy. And that's how, how I did you be. diagnose yourself with this? Oh, you can take a quiz online. You take a quiz. We have to do yeah. it. Okay. We'll definitely we'll take the it. quiz. Yeah. Um, but do you like, I guess here's the thing. So Katie Childs is my, nervous system regulator. She posed a question for me. And I think this actually goes hand in hand with you. If you are in your masculine or you are denying your feminine or not enough, you're not submerged enough into it. Where was the moment in time? Can you pinpoint the moment in time where you felt like you had to go to your masculine or you felt like you had to abandon your feminine? And for me, I remember in college, I was just head over heels for this guy. And he told me that I was a full-time job. He's like, you are a full-time job. You are a lot. And I never realized it, but that was always there back here. Like, don't be too sparkly. Don't be too, yeah. you know, don't be too this. Don't post too much. Don't be too, you know, like chill, like tone it down, like whitewash mm-hmm. it a little bit, like chill. Yeah. So I feel like for me, that was that. So what was your moment? Can you trace it back to when you abandoned your feminine? Um. I, so I, I mean, I had a million situations. I used to have that as well. I was always told I was too much. I was too loud. Be quiet, like sit down. It's Monica's world. Like it was always very much that like too much energy. Um, and, uh, so that's one part of it for me. The biggest thing was that I idolized my dad. My mom was a stay at home mom. And it was very much like, you know, at school, the cool, like the cool moms had jobs, right? So my mom wasn't cool because she didn't have a full-time job. And, you know, society played a big role in it as well of like the TV shows that you're watching. And I idolized the girl boss culture. I wanted to work corporate and wear high heels and wear those cute outfits. Like that is what I wanted. Um, And I idolized that like hardworking. I saw my dad working all the time. He was traveling all the time, you know, and I, we lived in New York when I was growing up, when I was very young, we lived in New York city. So that probably added to it, I believe as well, because the movies and New York Mm -hmm. city, like they also idolized everything. And were you, was gossip girl your generation? I don't know how different. Uh, no, I was too age. young. Too no, young. I was, okay. I'm 27. I was too young, okay. but, um, okay. but yeah, like I, you know, I remember like dad would bring me into, or mom would bring me into work to see dad and he worked in the Rockefeller center and like, it was just so glamorous. So I remember so much just wanting to be older so I could work and I could travel and I could just be like very gung ho. So that was my biggest thing. I wasn't even I didn't even consciously choose to abandon my feminine. That was one. I also was fed a lot of programming of next time I'm coming back as a man. There was a lot of programming of 
women get the bad end of the stick. Like we have to deal with having our periods. You know, I was at a school oh. where they fed a lot of fear around falling pregnant of having a period. And it was, so it was a lot of that as well. There was so many different layers at the same time. So there was complete disconnection from my body, disconnection from my womanhood, fear around, you know, falling pregnant, fear around my period, which is obviously like the most feminine parts of ourselves. And then there was also this idolization of men and, you know, working hard, the girl boss coach culture, hustling and all that kind of stuff that just over a period of time led me to feel like, well, I want to be more like a man than a woman. Like people don't believe us when I say it, but I used to hate being a woman because I really thought that we had it so hard and not saying we don't sometimes, but it's men have it hard as well, you know? And it was just, it was always like men have it easier, men have it easier, men have it easier. And obviously after a while that programming gets pretty unhealthy for a, you know, a teenage girl and a young adult. That's so interesting. I think that I felt the exact opposite. Like I looked at it like, Oh, the guy's the one that has to ask us out on the date. The guy's the one that has to pay for the date. The guy's the one that has to do this. The guy's the one that has to do this. Like, I I felt like it was a lot more pressure on a man in their 20s than a woman. But I, I still certainly identified the pressures that were on women and on us as well. It's like, well, we have to look a certain way. I always think about the thing of like, my husband can just get up in the morning and like fluff his hair and he's like good to go. And like, why has it, why is it put onto us that we are, it's like, we have to put this war paint on our face. We have to put these heating tools in our hair. There's like so much more expect, of course, it's not an every morning thing, but there's a, a more of an expectation for the outer appearance of women, obviously. And then don't even get me started on like heels and the, you know, we got to tape up our boobs and begin to have to do something backless because this shirt is deemed sexy and whatever. There, there is a, a lot of that, but I also like thought that stuff is fun and like think that is part of the beauty and the creativity of being a woman. Totally. And I'm with you on that. Like you can choose to perceive it as being a woman is really hard work, or you can choose to perceive it as seeing it as just the beauty of being a woman. And at the end of the day, if you don't want to strap your fucking tits up whilst you're wearing a backless shirt, you don't have to. If you don't want to wear makeup, you don't have to. And a lot of the narrative these days, which doesn't help, is women constantly saying, like, I don't want to wear a bra. I don't want to do this. Like, why are you making me like women shouldn't have to wear makeup? And it's like, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that. But the problem is, is like, we, it's just, there's so much programming right now on social media and obviously in conversations and whatnot, that's continuing to feed this narrative of it's so hard being a woman. And then we believe that narrative as well. Um, and so, and I used to think that, right. If it's so hard being a woman and I still do all of the things I, like I, you know, I do my hair every day. I put makeup on every day. Yeah. I wear a nice dress, but I do that because I genuinely want to feel good. And I exactly. know I feel better when I've done my hair, when I put a cute dress on, when, you know, I've got some mascara on, I feel better and I can love myself with, you know, my natural hair and no makeup and gym gear on. And I love myself when I'm like fully made up. I don't love myself more when I have makeup on. I don't think that I'm more value, more worthy. And the problem is a lot of women internalize I am more worthy when I'm dressed up. And they project it then on so-and-so is making me do this. Like women have all this pressure on themselves. I'm like, no, 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 you have put this pressure on yourself. You are mm-hmm. telling you, you are telling yourself I am more that loved. That is so true. I am more loved. I am more worthy when I'm dressed in a certain way. And yeah, even when it comes to like, you know, the, 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 like the, the marketing towards women of staying young and whatnot, I'm like, yeah, who, and they kind of blame people blame whoever they want to blame. And they often blame men. And I'm like, who are the ones telling women we need to stay young? It's not men. It's women. We do it to each other where we keep feeding it. No man is like, of course, there's some men that will like pay for women to get a boob job, but most of the time it's women choosing to do that. It's women putting pressure on other women by them doing it for themselves. And then obviously just, you know. I I think it can go like a few different ways. And it's almost like, just find your tribe that fits the narrative that you want to tell yourself, whether that is like, no, I need to be the scruffy, whatever, like, okay, no, I need to be the made up and done up person, like, or the, as far as the youth and and whatever, like surround yourself with those people or 
have your services or listen to, to your podcast to reinforce the message in your head that like, this is what I'm choosing and this is okay. There's this messaging that's been going around in recent years that I really appreciate. And it's like, I wear this outfit for other women to notice me and to notice my style and the effort I put into this and not to attract other men. And I think that's so true. I think that's really how I feel. Like when I go out, granted, I'm not single. I'm not trying to attract other men, but it's like, I dress for me. I dress to be creative. I love style. I love, you know, I love noticing other women and what they're wearing. I love being complimentary about it. I feel like that is such a fun part of the, like being in your feminine. Um, And I do remember somebody saying to me, a a guy friend of mine, who's very close, he's like a brother, we can talk like this, but he was like, I'll tell you, like you, I've never seen you dress so slutty as when you like, since you've been a married woman. (laughs) And I'm like, it goes you know what, like you're... this. Do you remember like, okay, when we were in Philly in our prime, we had the skankiest, like fast fashion held together by a shoestring, Long, like covering kinda. only what you legally had to cover. And then you get rid of it all when you no, get married see, and you're just like, I don't... I'm married and I'm wearing like a sweater now. And then you go back no. into it. I think I was vice you versa. You stayed skanky? I think I, no, I went skankier. And that's what he was ah. saying because <laughs> I felt- Okay, this can't be misconstrued. Because you're a Florida girl now. <laughs> as, no, it was like, this can't be misconstrued as me doing this for a man. Because mm. I'm married. I'm not okay, trying to attract you, men right here's now. Here's a question for I'm you. I'm just do saying, you, I feel good about my body, and this is what I want to wear, and I'm doing this for me. Do you and wear skankier like, things? And I say skanky. My sister and I, like, we have to share this thing where she's like, Oh, hot and skanky. Like that is good. Like hot yeah, and skanky me, is great. But like, do you, gotta, do you wear her, skankier? What? Your bridal shower, which Monica, not sure if hot and skanky was used at your bridal shower, but every single thing yes. that we opened at Casey's, there was, we had like a lingerie party and everything was like, Ooh, like, look at this. Ooh, that's so hot. That's so skanky. Okay. That's but so lingerie is skanky. hot and skanky. Like Monica's dress I'd be like yes hot and skanky because it's like yeah so it's I don't it's, it's different it doesn't mean it, it's not face value don't worry, do I'm Australian find, we say like really offensive things out of love for people so you don't need to tell me but about I love this. that but do you give us one give us one wait what's hold on like no a, let me ask you this question <laughs> Jesus Christmas do you wear more hot and skanky things when you are going out with your whole friend group because you know there's going to be pictures, you know there's going to be stories, you know there's going to be documentation, and you're like, I'm saving the hottest and the skankiest for when, you know, there's going to be pops there, paparazzi, instead of just the one-on-one date with Mark that he planned that you don't know where you're going. No. You wear the hot and skanky all day. I don't save it for just that. I think it's just however I'm feeling that night. And it's like, if I'm feeling good about myself and I want to like show off what I have, whether that's with my husband or that's with the paparazzi, I do it either way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And is that part of being in your feminine? Like, like showing it off? I mean, so I was doing this masterclass before I got on with you guys. And I was saying in it that being in your feminine is being you like being so in alignment with you. There is no one size fits all to this. And this is where a lot of women are like, you know, throwing these money and throwing money into these courses of like how to be feminine. And it's so like context deficient. It doesn't have this like groundedness of the nuances that exist. And therefore people are like, this shit doesn't work. Or like, I can't sustain this like lifestyle, whatever you want to call it. And my take on it is when you heal all of the trauma and all the shit that's made you not you, right? You've, you've become a version of yourself to please others. When you heal all of that and you become so in alignment with you, you're then in your feminine. You don't have to try. There's, there's no thinking about, is this feminine? Is this masculine? You're just you. So sometimes I'm dressing like, you know, let's just say skankier, more skin, more cleavage out. Other times I'm not, but I'm not thinking about it. It just depends on how I feel for that day. So how your feminine is expressed will change moment to moment, day to day, phase of your cycle to phase of your cycle, because that's just being a feminine woman, but there's no like intense cognitive thought behind it. Right. So of course, as you get more into your feminine, you may start to dress more stereotypically feminine, but you are doing that because that is what feels right to you. If that feels right to you, you aren't doing it because, oh, then I'm in my feminine. Because I've had plenty of clients that are like tomboy, like more kind of tomboy in terms mm-hmm. of how they appear and they are 
like super in their feminine now. Um, and their looks are not that stereotypical feminine because feminine energy is an energy. It's not like a look. Mm -hmm. So much of what you said is resonating with me and actually makes me feel like I might be in more of my feminine than I thought. I think like probably through the last year is when I've felt the most confident in myself. And it's a lot of things have come together in my life at the same time. One of which, and I want to like backtrack to some of the comments I just made, like, yeah, the reason that I've been in my hot and skanky era is because I'm starting to feel better about my body yeah. after having two kids, you know? So I'm like, oh, okay. Like she is cute. She is this, like, I'm just accepting myself more and I, I've lost some of the weight or I've just like some of the the you know entire bag of symptoms that you get after pregnancy have have kind of gone away um but you had this one thing on social that I loved and you said I'm in such a good place because I don't care what somebody says to me I can say great you do it that way I'm gonna do it this way and mm -hmm. it's that confidence that you can kind of like once you finally garner that within yourself, that can lead you almost like you, you kind of just said it like into this place of feminine because you're not trying so hard right. to be something else. And I love that. And when you think about feminine energy, it's like, it's magnetic, right? You're drawing somebody in. She's not trying to please anybody. She's just like sitting on her throne and people come to her. So yeah, like when you're constantly trying to please everyone, I'm like, well, you're going to be on an uphill battle for the rest of your life because you're yes. always going to piss people off. You, people are always going to judge you. People are always going to not like you. Like not everyone's going to agree with you. How much energy when that you is. Yeah. And when you accept that, like people are going to hate you, people won't like you, especially if you're on social media, when you accept that life becomes so much easier and you have to live for you, not live for like to please. Cause you will, you will never please everybody. So like, stop trying. You never like, like, literally, like you. Yeah. No, like literally stop trying to please everybody because I mean, especially if you're trying to run a business, if you're trying to please everyone, no one's going to remember you because you're not yeah. right. exciting enough. Like you're boring. And there's just, <sighs> there's no return on that, right? Like if you're trying to right. please people that don't even matter in your life and like how much energy waste that is, mm -hmm. it's like take that energy and put that into something that means so much. And that's your relationship with your, your partner, your relationship with your children. Mm -hmm. Like, and I know some of the women are probably screaming back right now and are like, talk about energy suck. It's my children. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yes. Well, here. Here's a question though. But that, there's Gianna, more of a return there. We've talked about this before and Monica, you can maybe, I don't know if you want to speak to this more with your one-on-one -on -one clients, but how many women actually truly deeply know who they are? Um, most they of might know what to... they like. They might know what kind of circumstances they grew up around or make them comfortable or that they aspire to, but how many people really know? And that's something I'm going through. I'm like, mm -hmm. how, do I really know who I am? I know. It's like, if I asked even right now, like if I said the question to all the listeners of like, tell me about yourself, like really about like your soul, who are you at a soul level? I live Most here. People, I have three kids. I'm married. My yes. It's I'm how people here. see you from the outside. Right. Mm -hmm. So most people that come to me and like men included, they don't know who they are. And that's part of the reason why they want to do this work is because they want to just feel at home in their body. They want to feel connected to themselves and like, really like, this is me, take it or leave it. Um, and most of the reason why people don't know who they are is because they've never actually been, they've never felt inherently safe to be who they are, you know, from their childhood through their, you know, young adult years. And then even now it's like, they don't actually feel safe to be who they are. So of course they don't know who they are. So when you, you have to obviously be in an environment where you can feel safe to be who you are. Yeah. But it's not just the environment. It's not just being the right relationship. It's also about getting rid of all of that past shit that's shaped you. I like to say like, instead of wearing rose colored glasses, you wear shit colored glasses your whole life where you're looking <laughs> through the lens of everything that you were fed as a kid and as a teenager and as a young adult. And it's only when you take off those glasses that you actually can see yourself clearly. Well, this, this triggers me as, oh my gosh, this is a quarter life crisis. I mean, how many women do you coach where they're married? They have kids, they live in a community, they're ingrained in that community. Like they are a stick in the mud. Like they made their bed, they are lying it and lying in it. And all of a sudden they're like, well, actually, like I like this and I don't like that and I don't want this and I want to move. Yeah. 
I have so many friends going through that right now. And you're and, with and, like a man for a decade. You know what? I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Because I you do, we do as human beings, we change, correct me if I'm wrong, every seven years. There Correct. was like a turnover. Whether I think it's like a I thought, cell turnover. I thought that was cell your turnover. taste buds, but okay. Oh, I didn't know that. No, there is a cell turnover as well. You're right. Yes. Uh-huh. Every so, seven years. So, but to your point, so one of the reasons why people will never do work on themselves is because they are afraid of change. They are afraid of who they are going to become. They think that like everyone around them is going to reject them and like shame them, which could happen. But then it's like, great. If you're not going to unconditionally love me, like this is not a real friendship. Like you conditionally love me for like fitting in with everything. And as soon as I actually become a happier version of myself, now you don't love me anymore. But that's one of the biggest things that that stops people from doing this work on themselves is I don't want, I don't want to change because change can feel scary because you don't know what's on the other side of change. But what's interesting is like a lot of US clients, uh, more US than Australian and European clients and everywhere else in the world have this issue. It's more of a US yeah, thing. That's I've noticed where thing. you are like ingrained in this culture. Like, for example, like I now live in the South and I see it so prevalently in the South of everyone is people pleasers. Everyone yes. is like so nice that I'm like, and okay, in the South, being- like you're supposed to dress a certain way, act a certain way, yeah. marry a certain mm-hmm. type of person, yeah. be yeah. front row at church, be in the country club. You know, it's right. Like, it is. And like, I am not about a lot of that. And so <laughs> is that why I you don't, moved? there's so many clients down there. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I don't fit in with the crowd, but for a lot of women, oh. like the idea of no longer fitting in petrifies them. So they would rather like, and this is also something to understand is your nervous system. Even if what you have in your life right now doesn't actually please you, doesn't make you happy. If it is in your comfort zone, it feels safer to your nervous system. So as a human, as an animal, you are programmed to stay with what feels comfortable, then go into the unknown and change. That's also why it's so hard to actually change because you're literally going against your primitive responses. We need, especially as women, to be in a sense of community. So if there is something that could threaten the sense of community, most of us aren't going to do it. Most of us wait till we hit rock bottom to then actually be like, okay, there's enough at stake now. I am going to change because I'm so miserable. My intention for people is to do that, like to do the healing before you even get to that point of hitting rock bottom. That, I mean, that's my story. I was forced there. You know, my dad passed away when I was 27 suddenly. And next thing you know, I'm on that exact road where I'm forced to evaluate everything about my life to and change. Yeah. And that, yeah. And I'm really grateful for that because, and I say like, okay, like if I am in this really <laughs> shitty situation, then like, let me get what I'm supposed to get out of it. And I feel grateful for like the, the changes that I have made in my life. Um, and I think I come from like a, a harder perspective of where I'm like, yeah, like forget it, whatever. If you, if you make changes and people aren't there, then like screw it because I'm on the other side of it. But I know right. in the beginning it was really hard. It was really it's scary. Hard. somewhere in the middle. Yeah. But it's, how do you start? How do you start if you say, you know what? My nervous system is whacked out. You know what? Like I am in my feminine. I mean, I am in my masculine and I want to make a change. But Gianna, you said, you know, so many people who are like, Mm-hmm. I would say the first point, because most people don't know what it, they don't, they can't recognize what a dysregulated this is nervous so system surface, feels and like. I had just started hearing about this in the last year, maybe six months. Most people, they can't identify if they have a dysregulated nervous system. They can't identify if they're in their masculine. I used to just tell myself when I was super in my masculine, oh, it's my personality. Like I just thought that was just me right? because I am like quite a fiery person. So we're I just recovering thought, girl bosses. Like we're, right. we're millennial. I'm ambitious. Women. That's why I'm in my masculine. We well, just Case kind of and I think, say all the time, well, we're Italian. That's right. how we are. We're just, <laughs> right. you know, we're like. And we're so like we the flex us- tape guy and the boat <laughs> sinking. And we're just like Italian career woman. But like, we keep ourselves in these the boxes because we keep <laughs> labeling ourselves. So if I like, I would say that in a good place that, you know, you haven't heard before, just like, Oh, awareness. Everyone says that a good place to start with is actually figuring out what symptoms you have that are abnormal. So for example, like any kind of chronic health issues, gut issues, Crohn's, Crohn's, skin issues, insomnia, perfectionism, procrastination, chronic overthinking, um, constantly in unhealthy relationships, getting really reactive very quickly, <laughs> getting really <laughs> reactive really quickly. Like I could go on and on and on. 
figure out the list, list of symptoms because for most people, once they get a list of symptoms and they're like, holy shit, there's, I can tick every single box. Like if I was to give you a checklist that helps people to realize I need you to need do birth something control. about them. Lol. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly. You need birth control and maybe an antidepressant. <laughs> but that then helps oh. people to realize I really need to do work on myself because most of us just blow it off. It's not that bad. I'm fine. I have nothing to complain about. Positive, positive, positive. And it's only when we sit down where we can actually be like, and we have this list of symptoms that then we identify, okay, my body's really trying to tell me something. I either can keep ignoring and these symptoms can get so much worse. And then it's obviously even more work to then heal, or I can do something about it now. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I would say that is the first place I was going to, I was going to add on as best as you can. I know it's not easy for everybody, especially if you inherently don't feel safe in your body and just don't feel safe, like in your environment. Cause some of us, you know, to the outside world, we can have a very safe environment, but if we've grown up constantly feeling unsafe or constantly second guessing ourselves, constantly abandoning ourselves, it can feel really hard to hold ourselves in safety as we're expanding. So the kind of tangible thing I would say is to remind yourself like you have your own back. If people are going to reject you and shame you and judge you because you're shining your light and you're doing this work on yourself, it's because they're triggered. They're fucking jealous. They're jealous that you're growing and you're expanding and they don't have the balls to do that. It's, it's their projection onto you and you can either, okay, stay small to make them happy. And now you resent yourself and you resent them and the relationships now ended because of the resentment anyway, or you can realize that you have the opportunity to show them what can't like be the light, right? Be the example. You go do work on yourself. You become so much happier. This, they're going to see that happiness, even if they're jealous and triggered to begin with. And that flow on effect is going to happen where you get now get to pass on like the good karma, if you will, because now they're inspired to go and do work on themselves yeah. as well. Yeah, totally. I want to jump into a topic here that I'm pretty sure in almost 50 episodes, we actually haven't discussed Whoa. because Casey and I are like two little Catholic girls that still feel weird about talking about this in public, but you're the person to do it with. Okay. I want to talk about sex, baby. <laughs> I you know that you, I, <laughs> you have a reel that said something to the effect of look at your sex life and look at what it is that you want in the bedroom and how that can apply to what you might actually be wanting from your partner mm. in your relationship. Oh, Tell us so a little bit us, about that. Give us for instances. Okay, yeah. so basically, yeah, I kind of phrase it like taking subdom outside of the bedroom because the vast majority of women, even if you're in your masculine, we crave to just like be thrown up against a wall, like him to just throw us on the bed, rip our fucking clothes off, like ravish our whole being, right? Where we are essentially forced into a state of submission and surrender because he is just loving on us. And for a lot of us, why we are craving that is because we are so exhausted from being in our masculine. We need something outside of us to just force us into our feminine. And when we are then in our feminine and in that state of like submission with him, and obviously you're with a safe, loving man, like obviously that we're talking about when you're then in that state, it's just like, oh my God, it's fucking rejuvenating. Like it feels so good to our feminine nervous system. So mm -hmm. essentially so just let go for a little yeah. bit. So a lot of women will give themselves and men, we give ourselves permission to be kinky in the bedroom. We give ourselves permission to have like the subdom desires in the bedroom. Like that almost seems um, for a lot of people more acceptable because like it's sex it's behind closed doors. We don't have to talk about it. Like it's kinks and like kinks are kind of sexy and that kind of thing. And we don't realize that what we're actually craving is that in real life. And you would need, and nothing against like wanting subdom in the bedroom, but for a lot of us, we only allow ourselves to express like the subdom desires in the bedroom. And when we're then not getting those needs met in the bedroom, we get really like tense in our body because we need that submission, right? We need to just like let go. So you will, if you can take what you want in the bedroom and implement it in your real life, you will actually need less of it in the bedroom. Doesn't mean all of a sudden you won't want subdom. Give me an example like, of how you would implement subdom, that into I'm your saying, real life. Okay. So you want your man to like dominate you in the bedroom. Okay. You want your man like in real life, he's planning the dates. 
he's opening the door. He always drives the car. Like I mm. never, if I am with my fiance, I never drive the car. He I, will that is never, like a strict rule. Yes. He, he won't yeah. let me drive the car. Like one time we were driving in the snow and he was trying to get work done. So I was driving so we can get work done. And after like 10 minutes, he's like, pull over. This is ridiculous. And then he gets in the <laughs> car. He's like much better. You, he's like, we make jokes about it all the time. Like I'll be pe- picking up bags. He's like, Oh honey, your frail little arms can't pick those up. Let me grab them for you. And he's not saying it in like, some mean way we play with the sub dom like even language and that kind of like um just that kind of conversation we play with it to keep it fun and lighthearted right we're we're all so sensitive these days we take everything so seriously and it's sexy and it's hot when a man is dominating you in the bedroom but we want it in the bedroom because we want it outside of the bedroom and a lot of us aren't giving can ourselves you permission get, can to have you it outside. get results out of the bedroom And can, like, can the work start in the bedroom and translate to real life? Totally. Yeah. Like, it it can start in the sheets and go to the streets. You love, (laughs) that's great. I love that. I love that little phrase. (laughs) Yes. But the, the, the core reason why people often can't take it from the bedroom to real life is because of judgment. It's this whole, I got to be an independent woman. It's like a safe place in there. Right. Like it's mm-hmm. safe to let go of the independent because woman intimate. because it's sexy. Whereas, right. But it's also like, that's intimate. Right. Just the two of you. Whereas the taking it into, you know, the relationship is, could be in a public eye and there could be this, oh, well, what is, what's everybody else going to see, say right. if they see that he carries my bags or what, what are people going to say? And it's like, if you uh, strip all of that away, going to the, the previous conversation we had, like when you truly don't care what other people think and you can say, I'm going to do it my own way, like that's when you're letting in your real happiness. Uh, yes. And going back to like a lot of women don't give themselves, a lot of women aren't being them, like they're not being their true, their, their true self. So for some women, they're like, okay, well, I'm sexy and hot if I'm submissive in the bedroom. And like, that also feels good. So I'm going to like, I will give myself permission to be submissive in the bedroom because he wants me to be submissive. He gets more turned on. I'm pleasing him. Like it's that whole narrative again of what does the other person want? How can I please the other person? What's the hot, sexy thing to do? But then in real life, right now, it's not hot and sexy to be submissive to your husband. You need to be an independent woman. You need to be hustling. You got to be making your own money. You can't trust men. I mean, you look at Instagram reels where women are like, I don't want to be the breadwinner or like, I, I love my man looking after me and taking the lead. Who are, who are the women? Sorry. Who are the people in the comments blowing them up with negative messages? Other women. Women. So it's this like, well, you, are you familiar with the Harrison Butker speech? Oh, Gianna, did yeah. you see that? Oh. The chief's kicker. Yes. And you know, he's yes. basically saying like, you can be in your feminine and you can stay at home and you can raise your kids. And, and, you know, that was a hot button issue for people. And that really threw people over the edge. And do you sometimes get, because in that prepper space, it is like the stay at home mom, the husband provides, she raises the babies, she homeschools. Do you get called like, Oh, are you like a MAGA chick? Are you like conservative? Like, do you get attacked and like people assume your political views because of? Oh, like they assume I'm conservative because yeah. I, well, here's the thing. People will assume that and then they realize I own the business. My hu- my partner, <laughs> work, my, my husband-to-be works for me. Uh, I'm the breadwinner. Like I bought the house. Like, you know what I mean? They're, then they're yeah. like, oh, so I can't fit. I can't fit into a box because and that well, also I would drive people crazy too. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, but also, because with my book, for example, people could pigeonhole my book when it comes out to be conservative, but I'm not political. I mean, I'm Australian. We don't have, like, in the, the US, you guys have a very, like, you're one side or the other, which. We weren't always like this. This is a scary, this is just it's, a it very is really, to me, thing that we've to got me, going on. <laughs> it's really weird because I'm like, no one is that black and white. No, no one is just like this or that. And what I don't, I mean, I get no, it. You would think that it's like the Yankees and the Red Sox in the World Series and like somebody took out Derek Jeter's leg. Like it's, that is what yeah. the country is like right now. It's wild because, um, I mean, you can't like, we can't pigeonhole ourselves like that anyway, but um, we weren't even going down that political situation. Point is, is that, yeah, like as an Australian um I don't even actually understand the US political climate and I purposely haven't learned it because uh when someone asks me a question I'm like are you poli- like are you liberal or conservative half the time I'm like wait which one is which like I just don't like I I purposely kind of stay 
you know, innocent with all that stuff, because none of this is political. None of this is rooted in like how I grew up, you know, how I grew up wasn't like this. This was me going through my journey and then consistently doing this work for like seven years with women where I am constantly seeing the same problems. This is not a fucking political agenda. This is not about, I am a traditionalist or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, what's funny is maybe people behind our backs make comments about like me and my fiance because I'm the breadwinner and like we're not we don't fit into the kind of southern norm and he grew up in the south so he's southern and all that kind of stuff and you know it's the same weddings the same friendship groups like everyone's kind of the same people might comment behind our backs but they never do it to my face or anything like that because I they know that I wouldn't tolerate that they know that I have too much self-respect to accept any of that bullshit anyway so like yeah, I don't even worry about if someone else is thinking X, Y, Z about me because of where we live. You mentioned your book. And before we close out, I want to give you an opportunity to to talk about some of the things that you offer and where people can find you, because I know this has definitely sparked some curiosity and learning more. So when, when does your book come out? Uh, it comes out in February of next year. And what's, a, what's it about? Um, I mean, it's kind of about what we spoke about. I wrote, it took me five years to write the book. It's heavy. It's uh, rooted in a lot of research and um, like I've done surveys and everything over the years, which has helped me to really gather more information. And it's rooted in obviously all the client work that I've done. Essentially what it's talking about is how society is making women feel like in order to be enough to love, successful, et cetera, we have to be more like men. And in order for men to basically be good men, they have to be more like women. But funnily enough, yeah. no one's fucking happy. Everyone's miserable. Everyone's <laughs> sex life sucks. And we're all complaining about the opposite sex. So the book is essentially so, about yes. coming back Sounds to women right. being in their feminine and men being in their masculine because every, and like working together and not thinking that we're equals because we're not the same. Like we're equal in the sense of, we both deserve equal respect. We both deserve, you know, equal rights, whatever it is, but we're not equal because how can two humans with a completely different biology and a completely different hormonal profile be equal? Like we literally are so different in terms of our functioning. So that's basically what the book is about. And, um, I'm really excited for it. It's going to be great. Well, congratulations on that. We'll Thank definitely you. look forward to it Thank and, you. um, drop your social handle and your website. Social is uh, Monarchy Yates Health. Website is monarchyateshealth.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, guys. And seriously, go check out her social. It's amazing. Thank you. And congratulations to you and your upcoming wedding. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it, Jenna. 